Hello, everyone. We have got a great episode for you and a handful more coming over the next few weeks. I hope that everyone out there is keeping safe and keeping themselves healthy, both physically and mentally in these crazy times that we are living in. I am your host, Charlie Chapel, and today we get to sit down with a proper legendary casting director and a man who has been on a ton of long-running series, casting director Jeff Greenberg. Jeff is one of those rare people born and raised in Los Angeles. He also happens to have grown up obsessed with being an actor and came into casting naturally while working in the theater. Decades later, he is cast on everything from Cheers to Frasier, Wings, Ugly Betty, News Radio, My So-Called Life, and the most recently wrapped up, Modern Family. Jeff has got so many great stories, I just want to jump right in, so without any further ado, I hope that you learn as much as I did. I think it's always best to start these conversations at the beginning. So where did you come from, Jeff, and, and how did you get here? <laughs> Born and raised in Los Angeles. Uh, wanted to be an actor from my earliest memories. Mm. It was all I cared about was, you know, it, television. And then when I was introduced to the theater, that's all I wanted and the movies. And I was obsessed with it. It's all I ever wanted to do. And uh, went to college at UC Irvine and got a degree in acting and was an actor for 10 years after college and uh, loved it. But I totally struggled. I, you know, I really lived on a shoestring. I got jobs here and there to just get by. And uh, even with that, I loved it. I had a million job jobs in restaurants and hotels and retail and uh, Jane Fonda's workout. And I made the money so that I could have acting classes and little old things like rent and food and gas. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I worked while I was doing that. I worked at the Mark Taper Forum for a while. My acting teacher was Gordon Hunt, who was the casting director there. And they needed an intern in uh, the casting office. And uh, I started just, uh, from an actor's point of view, it was the greatest job because I was privy to auditions. Mm -hmm. And I would read with actors and see what actors were doing right and wrong. And I sort of got a taste of what that was like. Um, I had no desire to switch my career, but I thought that was cool. And then at a certain point, one of the other casting directors there, Linda Francis, went off on her own. She was casting movies. Yeah. She needed an assistant. And uh, she called me and said, I'm starting a movie tomorrow. Uh, are you free? And I said, yes. And the movie was the first film for Children of the Corn. New World. Nope, it was Angel, Honor Student ah, by Day, Hollywood one... Hooker by Night. <laughs> and I, on the first day, I not only loved it, I got it. For some reason, I liken it to Alice Through the Looking Glass. I just, someone cracked open a door, I walked through, and literally my life changed. It and clicked. I never acted again. I clicked. You never Everything, acted again after that? I never acted again. Well, really? I have sort of more recently uh -huh. just... I, quirky little things here and there that people ask me to do, sure. but not as a career. And um, I just took to it. Mm. And all of my passions of acting somehow came in handy. How to, how to, you know, analyze text, how to talk to directors, how to talk to actors. I had a photographic memory for actors and names. Mm -hmm. And I would, all the decades of staring at the end credits of TV shows and just memorizing them. I, I didn't, I just did that it without stuck in your head. Without, it just stuck. Yeah. So I had this whole Rolodex in my head of actors when people that knew what a Rolodex was. And I, I just loved it. And I, I worked with Linda for about three years. We mm -hmm. cast eight or nine movies. Yeah. And then I got a call out of the blue from some old friends of mine who uh, I had done summer stock with in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, uh, my friend David Lee. He was now uh, a new producer on Cheers. They were looking to replace their casting director mm -hmm. because the casting director was bringing in too many familiar faces that the producers were seeing on other TV shows and on commercials, mm -hmm. and they didn't want that. They wanted fresh. Yeah. And I went and met with them, and all we did was talk about theater. And I, that was the right thing because they were – passionate about theater glenn and les charles and jim burroughs yeah. the creators of cheers mm -hmm. and somehow i got that job i didn't even have a casting resume <laughs> I, I and it was my first job on my own 
And I didn't know what I was doing. I had never cast a series, but I lucked out. And my associate was uh, had worked on the show as the casting associate for a, the original casting director, Steve Kolzak. Mm-hmm. So she knew the show, and I uh, I knew the actors, and I figured out all the other stuff. Yeah. And I started in the fifth season, uh, which uh, when I started about a month in, Shelley Long gave her notice that she would be leaving at the end of the year. Yeah. So one of my first big assignments was start thinking about who could play Shelley. And that turned out to be famously Kirstie Alley yes. after it was a six month process and it was a, a lot of secret machinations going on, but it ended up being her. Um, she joined the show in the sixth season and the show got more popular than it ever was. Which is crazy because it, it was already super popular, but it super blew popular. Up. Yeah, it blew up. And she was the unifying factor. Yeah. And it was, uh, she stayed for six seasons. Um, and I was in hog heaven every day of my life. I was working on Cheers, which I was in awe of and quite quickly became accepted as part of that family. And they saw what I had to bring to the table. And I just would bring in theater actors and we flew in tons of actors from New York. Yeah. Something that wasn't done very often then. We only paid top of show to the actors. We never paid a lot of money, but everyone wanted to do Cheers as they do all the best written shows. So I I would mention great theater actors that my producers knew. They didn't care about a name. They weren't stunt casting. They didn't want to do stunt casting. They wanted the best actor. Yeah. And I was a theater rat. I, you know, would go to New York every year, see everything. Mm -hmm. And I was, I just spoke their language. So it was a marriage made in heaven. And it, it, um, from cheers, everything else came. I mean that, so you're, you're coming in five, going into six, Kirstie Alley. What was that search like to find? You said it was a six month long search, but what was the process of finding that person? Cause you, you already have a bunch of really established, strong voices on a show to have somebody new come in and kind of mix things up, but replacing one character, what sort of things and strengths do you need to look for to be able to find somebody who can be as bankable as Kirsty ended up being? Well, my walking orders were to, they were, they were developing a character uh, who would be diametrically opposed to Diane. Shelley Long okay. character. Yeah, yeah. Diane Chambers, they said they wanted someone dark, sultry, and ice queen. That was yeah. the first description. I had just seen the week that they gave me that description, and it wasn't written yet. They were just, you know, I had seen Cat on a Hot Tin Roof at the Mark Taper Forum, and Kirsty played Maggie the Cat. It was a ah. great production directed by Jose Quintero. And she brought enormous humor to that part, and I knew that play very well. And she just, and she was the hottest thing ever. She was so stunning. Yeah. And I thought she was funny. And, you know, the producer said, you know, we, we have a lot of time. This was like in November. And, you know, they, they made episodes until March or April. And then the new season wouldn't be starting till next July. Mm-hmm. So there's a long time. They said, we have time unless you think there's a reason we should be quick. I said, well, the best people get taken for other things. Yeah. So I would recommend sooner rather than later. So we, uh, we call, I called, I, I pitched Kirsty and Jimmy Burroughs had seen the play too, mm-hmm. who was one of the Cheers creators and our director. Yeah. And he thought it was an interesting idea. But of course, she would have to come in and read. So I called her agent and I said, and by the way, we didn't want to spook Shelley by sort of flaunting that we were replacing her so easily. So we really kept quiet about it. Yeah. In fact, my assistant and my associate didn't even know this was going on. We really kept it under wraps, be, we, just out of courtesy yeah. to Shelley. Yeah. So the agent said that Kirsty did not want to do television, but she would want to do Cheers. So it. it was, yeah, because all the networks were trying to do deals with her. She didn't want to do that. But she loved Cheers. So uh, we set up a 
very secretive audition on a Saturday at Paramount Studios on Stage 25 where we shot Cheers. And Ted and Rhea came and they wrote a couple scenes and Kirsty did it. We didn't film it. Uh, I don't know why, but we didn't. Mm -hmm. And then we liked her. Um, we thought she had a lot of potential. It wasn't a home run, but we liked her a lot. And they said, let's, you know, roll the dice and go with her. And Kirsty, uh, like the next day, had to fly up to Seattle to shoot a movie. So she was gone. We told the network what we wanted to do. And they said, well, we have to see her. She has to audition for us. And we didn't have, we didn't tape or film the audition. So they said, she has to audition. And I said, well, she can't. She's not here. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, uh, before we say yes to that, we need to see other people. So we had to see other people. Huh. So we saw a lot of ladies, a lot of famous ladies, uh, you know, your Sharon Stones, your Marg Helgenbergers, yeah. your Colin, Colleen Camps, uh, and, but nobody was Kirsty. And um, finally, after a few months of doing that, the network, Brandon Tartikoff, uh, the great Brandon Tartikoff was yeah. running NBC still at the time, and he was Cheers' biggest fan. He said, listen, if Glenn and Les and Jimmy don't know what they're doing, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be doing the show anyway. So let's trust them and let it be Kirsty. Mm -hmm. Well, then tack on two more months of just making her deal. Because the agent knew they had all the cards yeah. because we needed her. Yeah. She was the one. And You'd come back around left... to her, so she had all yep. the cards. Yeah. Yeah. So in retrospect, it, it wasn't a lot of money. Uh, now it's paltry money, but uh -huh. for then it was sort of big money. And um, we finally made the deal. And it was Kirsty. And she um, she was our new leading lady. Mm -hmm. When she started on the show, she was fine. She was good. She was doing what she was asked, but it wasn't really popping. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't. It was good. It wasn't great. It wasn't bad. It was good. About seven or eight episodes in, there was a scene. We were in rehearsal, where Rebecca had to go into the office. Uh, you know that door over, yeah, yeah, sort of, sort of, you know, stage left mm -hmm. that goes in the office. Whoops! And uh, she in she couldn't Kirsty couldn't open the door. It was stuck, and she got really frustrated. And really, it was really funny. And they went, "Aha! Mm. She's the she's the perfect ice queen who underneath is a wreck." And they yeah. saw it, and they immediately started writing to that and uh, she, that's when she blew up it they they it was so apparent and when and then they started writing toward that and it even she just blossomed and bloomed uh because it was it was tailor-made to what she did great and then from then on it was just crazy great yeah I mean, that and show then, had to have been incredible to be a part of. Did you go into it as a fan? Or did you... Oh, my God, yes. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I, I'd seen every episode and was, you know, I was, I was very intimidated when I started that job. It was my oh, first nice. job. I didn't even know what you're supposed to. The only time I had, you know, I had, as an actor, I did a small part on One Day at a Time, which mm -hmm. had gotten cut. So, uh, you know, I had never hung out on these um, sound stages of these multicam shows and I just sort of they were going to rehearsal every day for run throughs and all and I was a part of it and I would just stand in back because yeah. I just didn't know how or where to be but in time and it didn't take long I relaxed into it and felt part of the process and the actors I was bringing in they were liking they were fresh actors I knew from local theater and the big guest stars I'd bring in from New York mm -hmm. And for some reason, it just clicked. And that's sort of been the watchword of my faith in that the shows I try to do, I try to bring fresh faces because that's what they, those were my walking orders then. Yeah. And it worked uh, fresh then. Fresh faces. It worked then. And that's what I still try to do. You, you know, and I try to. do a great job with it. Uh, yeah. And it's, you know, it's sometimes it's tricky when I'm casting a 
a pilot, something new. There's so many great actors out there. And something I often have to say to the agents, there'll be someone wonderful, but we've seen a lot of them and it's just not fresh. We've seen them do it many times. They've had Mm -hmm. many series and they always want to try the fresher people first. Mm -hmm. If you can't find it, then you can go to those people. And it's really frustrating for the agents because those actors are very talented, but the creators and the studios and the networks, they want fresher faces. Mm -hmm. So it still really applies. How do you continue to up your new supply of fresh faces other than putting out casting notices? Are you still going to theater? Are you still out Yeah, I go yeah. to, you know, I had a New York trip planned when this uh, lockdown happened. Yeah. Because there's a lot of great stuff this season there was. Yeah. Broadway's broken now. Yes, it is. Um, I go, I've been going every year for over 30 years. Yeah. And I go for a couple weeks and I will see, you know, 16, 18 shows. Okay. And I come back with that. I go to a lot of theater here. I cast theater here too. Okay. Uh, I didn't as a matter of fact. That. Yeah. 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 I've been doing some things lately that I have loved doing. That's so exciting. I can tell you about. Was it getting back, um, getting back into theater for you? Have you been doing that? It's. I've been doing it for the last many years. I, I cast a lot of shows out of the Pasadena Playhouse. Okay. And I just I just cast a play that was at the Geffen Playhouse starring Andy Garcia oh, wow. uh, called Key Largo based on the bogey and bacall movie yeah yeah and yeah that was great and i'm about to cast another uh play at the pasadena playhouse a new hilarious play by joe keenan who was one of the writer producers on fraser mm-hmm. and directed by david lee who created fraser oh, called cool. called uh roger and sylvia mm-hmm. and we were we had started casting but had to shut that down because of uh the virus yeah so well, yeah. with with casting theater and casting television, what are what are some of the m- major differences that you see when you're casting a play as opposed to television? There are so many less people that have to sign off when you're doing theater. Okay. It's really the director, and then you usually run the name by the, who's ever running the theater, yeah, just to make sure that they haven't heard any negative stories about them or whatever it's you know so sometimes it's just one maybe two people when you're casting a pilot there's you know 15 16 executives development executives casting executives at the studio level at the network level Mm -hmm. you have your creators you have a director you have it's just it's by committee yeah so that you're serving many masters and that's a very complicated juggling act uh <laughs> to to put together these shows and the the pilot casting process for me certainly is by far the most difficult because there's so many elements that are going on at the same time mm-hmm. it's really it's really hard what are some of but, those elements well you're you know you're trying to bring in actors that you know over a dozen people will like and ah. So, okay. and you're trying to bring in the best people and have, you know, you're dealing with agents who don't want their clients to come in. You say, but that, that the actor has to read for this part. We just don't know if they're funny or we, we need to see the chemistry with the other lead or whatever it is. Yeah. And a lot of agents are very reluctant to let their actors read, you know, at the higher level actors. Sure. And, but sometimes that they demand it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you're that, then there's, the budget of it all is one of the most difficult things that, you know, to be able to close deals with uh, actors who know how much value they bring is sometimes impossible. And quite often you can't make a deal Mm. with actors. You just can't. And you have to move on. You found the perfect person finally after reading hundreds and couldn't make a deal. So you have to start all over. It's very frustrating. There's always the time element. Um, and you're they're discovering the piece as you're reading it, you know, with all of the different actors that come in. They're finally seeing what it is. It's really fun if the material's good. But what happens more often than not is there's a lot of things that are fine. And you end up reading the same scenes, as I say, hundreds of times between all the pre-reads in my office and more readings for the producers. And sometimes the material just doesn't 
just doesn't hold. Uh, it doesn't stay funny. It doesn't stay fresh. A over really the course good show. Of all of those readings over the course of exactly, ah, and you go, "Oh my God, is this show even funny?" Huh? And then hopefully someone will come in and all of a sudden make it funny again. Right. When we were casting Modern Family, and there were ten series regulars, which is a a lot so for a many. half hour show. So many. The we really it was hard, and we really looked at a lot of actors. In fact, I I, always, I have this little chart that I always keep. <laughs> we saw one thousand three hundred and sixty four actors for those roles. Anyway, the auditions were really fun because even though the actors would come in and maybe not be it, mm -hmm. I brought in funny actors. I brought yeah. in good comic actors. So it was fun and funny because the material worked with almost everybody. Mm -hmm. But most of the time they weren't right or they weren't quite funny enough for the look or the, the age or something. It just wasn't it. Mm -hmm. And um, the... Chris and Steve are producers, you know, had very high standards and we weren't going to settle no. and we didn't. And we really came down to the wire before we got everybody. But it was, um, the casting process was really fun on that pilot yeah. because the material on the page was great. It's incredible. I mean, a plus yeah. great. Yeah. And that's, and then, and the, I always, if I'm lucky enough to get to choose what pilot I want to do, I always try to just get the best material because the better actors, respond to Gravitate. it you can get better people to even come in absolutely yeah yep um i mean and let's go ahead and jump forward a little bit to modern family we'll we'll touch stone back to you know i want to talk a little bit about wings and my so-called life and news sure. radio and fraser but let's jump to modern family because you guys just wrapped 11 years of this show um, mm -hmm. I rewatched the pilot of the show um in preparation for this and it's been a long time since i've seen it and and what I love about this pilot is, one, it is so extremely well-written, but they are 100% the characters that you end up loving through the series. There's not a whole lot of deviation from the characters that you see in the pilot to the characters that you see in season 10. Like, they've grown, they've changed for sure, but the writing is there. It, uh, it the is, writing is there. It the is first so well-paced and intelligent yeah. and... Uh, it, it's I, that seems rare to me in especially in the rare. sitcom world it is rare Charlie when I read the script for the first time I didn't have the job yet mm -hmm. I I really I think literally my jaw dropped I couldn't believe how great this material was and I really went after it yeah and uh, I will say Chris Lloyd and Steve Levitan, who are both extremely experienced before we even started, mm -hmm. they know how to develop character. Yeah. I've worked on the majority of the pilots I've done are not necessarily well developed story and character. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they're developed for the pilot. They're not developed sure. for the big arc of what a series could be. But Steve and Chris are golden at that. And, uh, so that and that's another reason why the auditions were so much fun. Mm -hmm. And it's true. I, I see that pilot every year because I, as I, I say, I, I lecture on the casting of the pilot and I'll show the pilot and then talk about how each of the actors were handpicked for their roles. Yeah. So I see it every single year. There is not a wasted comma no. in that, no. that pilot material. And it's touted as one of the great comedy pilots. Yeah because it reveals so much about character relationships creates that world there's that big the big reveal where you find out it's those three families are actually one family yeah you just don't see coming mm -hmm. i remember when i read it the first time i was so blown away and i i've been doing it for so long already that to ha to be blown away after you've been doing it for over 20 years is pretty great feeling so yeah those characters have really They've only got richer, but they're still there in the pilot of yeah. what they finally were. They really yeah. are. And I think that that is it's such a delight to go back and watch these things. Because I've been watching Modern Family for years, for a very, very long time. 250 episodes you guys did. It is one of the smartest comedies and sitcoms out there on television. But what I love about sitcoms is they allow you to do so much in such a short amount of time. And you can really rip people's hearts out while making them cry laughing. 
There's a, right. a simplicity to them. There's a, a beauty to them that I don't think a lot of other television shows can can grasp at because you're used to the setup, setup, joke, setup, setup, joke, setup, setup, joke. And then the way they can pull the rug out from underneath of you and give you like a really lovely moment. Um, even in the pilot when, uh, you know, Ed O'Neill takes everything back that he just said about this is a bad idea. Like it shows you what a family is in that moment. And it's kind of beautiful. I do want to talk a little bit about working with Chris and Steve. You worked with them early on in your career with Frasier and Wings, yeah? That's where I met both of them, you was did. on that show. Yeah. Chris was one of the showrunners, and Steve was the lowest on the, the writing totem pole. He was mm-hmm. a staff writer. Mm-hmm. And uh, I ended up you know, working with them many times after that, before Modern Family, mm-hmm. both of them, on different shows, including the... Uh, Chris was one of the show runners of Frasier yeah. and Steve was on the writing staff for a while. Mm-hmm. I think modern family was like the eighth project I worked on with Steve and Chris had, well, he was at Frasier for most of the time and I did a pilot with him too. Mm-hmm. So I had worked with them quite a bit. What is it about, um, the showrunner producer capacity and a casting director? How does that relationship one, get established well, and two, how do you continue to maintain and grow that relationship over the course of multiple very long-running shows? Well, you just you just try to get on the same page right from the get-go. Mm-hmm. Try to figure out the style of the show that they've created, that they're writing to, and start to get actors that elevate their material um, do their material justice and even make it better. Mm-hmm. And just you try to see if you can have the same taste. I've, I've done other projects where it didn't mesh, you know, and their vision was not clear and they weren't, producers might not seeing what I was seeing. I wasn't seeing what they were seeing. Mm-hmm. And it's not always a match made in heaven, but y- you just try to interpret what they're doing and give them what they're thinking. And if you can put a cherry on top of that, you know, if you can find someone that even, as I say, elevates it more. Yeah. And you, you know, it's, you know, when you're meeting on a new job, uh, like a new pilot or series with some producers you haven't worked with before, you know, you go in and you just sort of, you both sides try to click because you're going to have a lot of conversation and be spending a lot of time together. And, you know, they often will meet a few casting directors who have strong credits, and they'll pick the one who they like in the room the most. Mm-hmm. So, so you have to find a way to communicate with them. It's fun. You know, it's a comedy, which is my calling card. So you, you want to try to show that you have a sense of humor mm-hmm. and, you know, appreciate their sense of humor. And you just hope that you're going to be a good match. I mean, I think it's it's fascinating to see how people end up working with one another multiple times throughout a career, and then you land with someone uh, and, and a group of people that create something that really kind of changes the zeitgeist, that, that, that sticks and will last a very long time. Like you said at the very beginning of this when we talked about intention, the, the working with people who are that type of creative... I'm curious about finding those types of creatives and finding those types of scripts from your perspective that have a longevity because you've worked on Charlie, it's luck of the draw you think to, so? to get yeah. a show a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, when I say that to people, they go, Oh no, you're great. You deserve it. <laughs> but it's, but you never know what show is going to last. Sure. And you never know what show is going to click. Sometimes it, it, it feels like it's going to do well and it stays on for a year or two. Mm-hmm. You know, you just, you don't know. And when you enter into it, you just do the best job you can and cross your fingers. Mm-hmm. It's out of your hands, really. Yeah. Uh, like you use the word zeitgeist. That's what it is. It becomes its own thing. Yeah. And sometimes eclipses. And I, I, I've been fortunate enough to have the long runs of Cheers and Frasier and Modern Family and Wings and was wings, on for eight and years according to too. Jim and a, but, a lot. Yeah, 
But um, some of them were better experiences than others. Yeah. Some of them were like year to year you didn't know. Sometimes you'd get a three-year pickup, like we did one year on Fraser, which is unheard of at the time. Yeah. And so, but it's it's a complete fluke to land on a show that really runs, you know, a decade. Mm-hmm. And, and it's amazing. And everyone that's on the show, certainly on Modern Family, is so grateful for it because a lot of people on that show had been doing it a long time and it just doesn't happen. Yeah. Something that is really good. I mean, you know, and sometimes you're on a show that's not so good. That's just sort of stays on the air. Something like according to Jim, Mm -hmm. which was not a great experience for me, Mm. but it was a job. Yeah. You know, it's either, sometimes it's just a job and, uh, sometimes it's, you're thrilled to drive to work every day Mm -hmm. as was the case of, my successes. Yeah. Um, so I was listening to another interview with Christopher, um, and he talked about something that I wanted to bring up while talking about Modern Family, and it's the kids. Mm-hmm. You guys cast some really uh, incredible actors, but they're all very intelligent. I think that's something that people may miss when they d- just watch the show. That you know, Rico Rodriguez, he's he's an eight year old playing a forty year old. And Nolan Gould is a he's a Mensa genius playing the kid who gets his head stuck in the banister all the time. They were smart kids. Yeah, they were all Rico and Ariel and Nolan were all 10 years old Mm -hmm. when we started. Yeah, they were the same age. None of them had ever been in a comedy before. None of them. Yeah, but they they were just really good actors. And once again, Stephen Chris didn't want kids to come in and be cute and leave. So they they developed those roles, even though they didn't have a ton to do in the pilot. Manny had a lot to do. Mm-hmm. But they really they really knew what they wanted and they were specific. And I mean of the I was love my statistics about that show. For the role of Manny, we saw I saw a hundred and ninety Hispanic boys between the ages of eight and eleven. Yeah. And I only brought eight of them to the producers because hmm. only eight of them were worthy of being being seen again. So uh, it was a very complicated part. And kudos to Rico for having embraced it. Yeah. But it was a struggle. It was, he didn't come in and nail it. Mm-hmm. It was we really had to work with him. Yeah. And he got there. And then once it clicked, he was home. Mm-hmm. But those kids, yeah, they all were smart, are smart, and they just played what was on the page, the intention on the page. And because they had these hidden funny bones, it came to life. And then as the series went on in the first season, they started to write them more and more. And they saw, oh my God, they can do that. They can Mm -hmm. do that too. Nolan's physical comedy turned out to be a gift, a real gift that we didn't see coming. And all of them, I mean, I, I don't know that I've ever worked on a show that an ensemble show that was that balanced of those 10 people, adults and kids there, there, there was no, you know, central person that sort of stole the show. Right. In fact, one of my favorite reviews when we premiered was in USA today. And I think it said, um, the best actor on modern family is who's ever on screen at that moment. Oh, that's great. And I thought that was great. Yeah. And it's what it always was. And for when, for the Emmys, um, everyone was always submitted for supporting actor. They were never, ever a lead actor nomination because huh. they were all supporting actors. Yeah. A true like proper that. ensemble. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious, though, when, when in terms of casting children, because you've done a bit of casting children, uh, especially when it comes to families, how much of a prerequisite does intelligence play in casting children, especially for these types of roles? Well, it just has to be inherent, I guess. You know, I'm not looking for intelligence per se. I'm looking for a good actor. Right. But a good actor has to be intelligent to be able to uh, interpret what's on the page and bring it to life. And, you know, you have to, kids, especially when you're doing auditions for a pilot or, or you, you have, they have to jump through a few hoops, mm-hmm. even when it's a guest role. And there are a lot of kids in the 11 years of modern family who would audition. We would have, I would have them, if they did it well, they were reading for me, 
I would give them a direction, do it again like this, or do it again exactly like that. Quite often they can't. Mm. So, you know, you just, if they're smart enough to be able to do it well a few times they're probably smart enough to do that part yeah but you but it's once it, you don't know how people are going to develop over a long run and once again the the comedy gods smiled on us in so many ways in modern family and a perfect example is those kids mm-hmm. i mean all of them really. and to see them do to, sometimes you see them like uh, a kid will grow out of a show or They'll grow and it'll be a little bit different kind of feeling and vibe coming from them with them. It didn't it it not necessarily didn't change because they all grew and changed and became their own characters. But in relation to each other. Yes. Yes, absolutely. In another interview online, uh, you mentioned that with comedy much more than with drama, the material when auditioning and when performing must be respected to the comma. Because rhythm and pace and cadence yeah. are all so important uh, in in ha- what actually makes it work. I'm curious how often actors miss that mark and that understanding. And what does it mean when somebody is actually coming in and doing that properly? Well, I, I think I have a little bit of a reputation of being a stickler for the words. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and a lot of. I know I'm considered to be sometimes a tough <laughs> casting director because I really demand it because, first of all, the words are really good on a show like Modern Family. Yes. And in the audition, we audition f- for the producers. The writer producer is in there. Mm-hmm. So if the person is changing the words, it is so insulting to the writer uh-huh. yeah. for starters. Yeah. I mean, it's just... And sometimes they... Think they add words. They think it's funnier. They put on a little joke at the end, you know, to uh, to give it a little a punchline beyond the punchline that's already there. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so we, you know, if they're if they're good actors, they, there's a rhythm to the writing that's on the page already. If they just understand it and just say the words, and have a little bit of a funny bone, they'll be great. Mm-hmm. And I and I really when actors are pre-reading for me. You know, I'll say, don't add that um, don't switch that word, don't, don't invert that, you know, don't add that at the end. The, the, the blow to the scene is that's it. That mm-hmm. the, the punchline is there. They're not looking for, a, we're not looking for a comedy writer. We're looking for an actor that can do these <laughs> words. Yeah. And I have to say that a lot. I have to say. You do. A lot. Yeah. A lot. And it's more, and I've cast dramas as well, mm-hmm. and the they're not as concerned the producers if it's pretty close, mm. but in comedy they're very concerned, and sometimes actors just won't get the job if they've played around with the words too much. Yeah, that's not what we're looking for. No, I think I think the point that you make, the idea that we're not looking for a comedy writer, we have a bunch of those already. We need yeah, somebody to yeah. perform the words that have been written. Yeah, um, yeah. I, so it's a good point. It's it's very. I mean, it's just the number one rule. Yeah. Just say the words. Yeah. That are on the page. Um. Well, now that fam- Modern Family has wrapped up, um, I'm curious what your next 250 episode show is going to be. <laughs> um. Actually, no. I'm curious what uh, some of your goals are moving forward. You've accomplished so many things, and you've been a part of so many great projects. What sort of things do you look forward to now? I just hope I get to keep doing it. You know, I really <laughs> love it more than ever. I, I, nobody loves their job as much as me. I've always loved it. Mm. And I still am so enthusiastic about it. I just cast a great pilot that just when we were about to start to shoot it, the town locked down. Yeah. And I had the best time again. It's a great pilot. It's called Jeffries. And do you know Jim Jeffries? I He's love an Australian. Jim Jeffries. Well, this pilot is called Jeffries. Yeah. And it was co-created by him and Suzanne Martin, who I worked with on Frasier. Okay. And it's about his life. Huh. And it's a multi-cam show directed by my old friend, Andy Ackerman. And uh, Betsy Brandt is in it. Anthony LaPaglia is in it. Yeah. Some great other actors. Mm-hmm. We had a table reading. It was sensational. And then, and then the world stopped. <laughs> yeah. So, but it gave, but it was an important job because it was the one right after modern family mm-hmm. which is hard to top and who knows what the future of 
Jeffries will be. Yeah. But I had a great time, and it gave me I was sort of relieved that, oh, I could still have a lot of fun if something good comes my way. So I just hope, like I say, I hope things keep coming my way and I hope they're good. Sometimes you take jobs that are, you know, a B instead of an A plus because mm -hmm. you want to keep working. Yeah. And sometimes they end up being an A plus. Sometimes they end up being a D plus. You don't know. You don't so know you till have you're the, in it. Do you have those anxieties around that still after always. all of you? You do. Always. Oh, I always, I always think I'm never going to work again, and you know, <laughs> just because that's who I am. But I hope that I get to, and because I love it, I, I don't, I really don't think I'll ever retire. Mm -hmm. Because why would I? I get so much. You know, I get a lot of time off anyway. Mm -hmm. It's my job is never twelve months a year. So I've never been burnt out in all these years. I've been doing it over 35 That's years. Yeah. And I've never been burnt out ever. Mm. So I'll, why wouldn't I keep doing it? What a blessing that is. Yeah, total blessing. Yeah. So I've got some more questions about Modern Family, but I want to jump back and talk a little bit about some of your other shows. Um, we talked yeah. a little bit about Cheers, but I want to talk about My So-Called Life. Um, okay. It's created by Winnie Holzman. Uh, starring Bess Armstrong and Wilson Cruz, Claire Danes, Devin Grummersall, A.J. Langer, Devin Odessa, Jared Leto, Lisa Will Hoyt, and Tom Irwin. I had never seen this show. Um, it was just a little bit before my time when it came out. And everyone that I talked to said, you have to ask about my so-called life and you have to watch <laughs> all of it. And I did. Um, oh, wow. I, all 19 episodes? All 19 episodes. Knocked them out wow. uh, over the course of the past couple of weeks. We've been under lockdown, so I've had a lot of time to watch things. Perfect. Um, I really enjoyed this show. I think Claire Danes is incredible. It's undeniable. Leto is great. And yep. the gr friend group around Angela's character is wonderful. It really helped Claire and Jared take off. The, they were fresh faces at the time. Very. How did you become part of this project? The great Linda Lowy found Claire Danes and Mary Goldberg cast the rest of the pilot. Okay. But they did not continue with the show. So uh, then I came aboard. Okay. So I'm very proud of the work we did. I cannot claim credit for that extraordinary cast. I really enjoyed the show and I kind of wanted more even when it got to the end of the 19. I know. You know, it was, it was frustrating because ABC just wasn't behind the show huh. and it just never, it just never clicked. And everybody that knew the show loved it, mm -hmm. but it just, it didn't get the support. So it went away and it was a real shame because yeah. it was real quality. Yeah. What was the process coming into a show um, after just the pilot and, and going on into episode two? What is that process like for a casting director who has pretty much the main cast already squared away? Now you're filling in the gaps and continuing to tell the story outside of that. Right. Well, you're just you're jumping on a moving train. It's yeah. already sort of the style of the show is established. And then when I met with Winnie Holtzman and got the job, we really just talked actors. Mm -hmm. And she told me about some parts that were coming up. And I would say, how about Mary Kay Place for that? And she'd go, oh my God, I love Mary Kay. That would be great. Mm -hmm. you know. And so, you know, like at an early, it was like an early pitch meeting where she was just telling me, and I would sort of suggest a few people. And I, we were on the same page. Yeah. The, the actors I was suggesting, she loved and it it uh, just moved on smoothly from there. Is that one of those luck of the draw things as well, being able to speak the same language and have the same reference points as the creators or showrunners that you're coming in to work with? Pretty much. I guess now I have more of a calling card because I've done so many more things mm -hmm. where if a casting director wants to hire me for their comedy, they can see my taste because there's so much film of the shows that have been on for so long. Mm -hmm. That, you know, um, if I don't tend to do the broadest comedies, so maybe if there was a broad comedy, they would want to use somebody else. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can find actors to be broad if that's the style, and sometimes it is, which is great. Uh, but I, I don't know. You just sort of, um, you just, I don't know. There, there, there have been 
shows. I worked on uh, that show Up All Night, which was uh, Christina Applegate. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Maya Rudolph. Mm-hmm. And um, I didn't really click with the producers. They 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 didn't respond to a lot of my ideas. And, we you know, we would get things cast and all, but it never... It just didn't flow like many of the other shows I've worked on. Mm-hmm. And it just, it was, the communication wasn't good. Uh, and that just sort of happens. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, this is, a, I mean, it's, it, I think it's easy to look at your career and go, oh, he's just very good at all of this. And, and it probably goes swimmingly every single time he steps into the casting room. Um, <laughs> I think it's, it's 100% uh, valid that, no, this is a difficult job that you do. This is sometimes communication isn't there. Sometimes the the budget isn't there. Sometimes the actor, you can't mm-hmm. nail them down. Whatever it may be, like there are a lot of things that you have to go through to execute your job well. Um, right. And there's also, when you're on a show, the, the communication isn't just about the actor that you're hiring for the next week's episode. I'm usually privy to like the next three or four shows coming up. Mm. So I'm getting outlines and first drafts and talking to the writers of each of them and trying to hone in early on what they're looking for the specifics about the age and the style and with which ethnicity and and you know prototypes whatever so that when we finally get there it feels like you're cutting to the chase and just bringing them exactly what they want but it's like you just you follow the process for a while until it's time to actually bring in the actors to read Mm -hmm. So you can just bring in a few actors that will nail it because you know really what they're looking for. And the communication on Modern Family was really good in that way because every time, every week, we would do a producer session with the writer of the episode and the director. Mm-hmm. And uh, But I'd been prepping, prepping those episodes for weeks, you know, just large and small parts coming up and yeah. gather, gathering film on people and, you know, and so we would usually just have one session per episode. And that's uh, all you would need because you were prepared. That's all we would need usually, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting. You mentioned the idea of tastes. And it's one of the things that I really love to talk to casting directors about because uh, through doing this show, one of the things that I feel like I've established and one of the things that I think permeates throughout the industry is uh, taste. Taste is so very important and casting directors really trade on their taste. So I'm curious with you, what are some things that maybe you saw early on in life? You said you were, you loved television, you loved theater when you discovered it. Um, where do you, where are some of the places that your taste comes from? Such a great question. I just, just the things that would pop out for me is I would watch TV or go to the theater. Just, for, just, I don't. I, I don't think I can define it. Mm-hmm. Just just someone that really moved me or made me laugh, someone that was interesting in and of themselves, their their look, their voice, mm-hmm. their presence, their vibe, whatever all of those things were, make uh, checked off. You know, when an actor comes in, I can tell so much even before they start to read just in terms of how right they are for a part. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll walk in the door and I know we're going to do a scene, but I can see clearly that they're not right for the part. It it might be a physical thing. They might be too old or too young or too tall or I I don't know, or they're, they're not sophisticated enough or they're not rural enough, whatever it is, you sometimes can just see it. And after about a sentence or two, you can tell if they're good or not mm-hmm. because you just know the style that you're looking for and you can see if the actor's connected or not very quickly mm-hmm. with the material. If they're making it their own, if they're making it sound like they're saying these words for the first time, that they're not words on a page that they memorize or saying, but they're really saying them for the first time in the world. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can, that's, if you've been casting for a long time you just can recognize that yeah so in terms of that taste watching television watching theater were there anything is there anything that stands out to you that you watched early on that that influenced you towards wanting to be a part of this industry 
Well, I always wanted to be an actor. Just, just all so I always wanted to be a part of the industry. It's all I've ever dreamed of. Was there any, what was the influence for that, though? Just seeing I it? Don't, being, just seeing it and yeah, wanting to do yeah. it. You know, when I was 10 years old, my parents took me to see my first musical, and it was Bye Bye Birdie. And there were kids in it. And then the wow. second musical was The Sound of Music. And there were kids in it. I went, I want to do that. I would point to the stage and go, I want to be up there. I don't want to be sitting here watching that. I want to be doing that. Yeah. And I, and those, the first two big musicals I saw had kids. So I went, oh my God. I can't and I, that. I don't think I had the nuts and bolts put together what it would take to do that. I just went, I want to do I, that. looks like fun. Yeah. And I was, you know, I was a big ham as a kid and very, had a lot of fun doing shows at home with my sister and we had a great time doing all that. I don't know. It just, it just was my path clear. It was clearly my path. Mm -hmm. oh, I love it. I think, <laughs> I think that that's great to, to hear where people find those first like sparks of joy for this industry, uh, I think is important because we all have, I think if you really see, if you come into this industry really serious, uh, about wanting to be a part of it. You have one of those moments or you have those times in life that it just lights you up and you're like, I can do that. I want to do that. That looks awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to talk just a bit about some of the other sitcoms that you've done. Um, you did a, a run on News Radio, which is a show that I adored growing up. Um, the cast of that show is incredible. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about Frasier and a little bit about Wings. Wings is... I don't know why, but it always stood out to me when I was a kid as one of my favorite shows. I still watch Wings on, you know, Hulu. There was a character that had the same last name that I have, and for some weird reason, I saw myself in Thomas Hayden Church. They felt like characters that I knew back in Arkansas, um, which I, which was weird for me because it wasn't in Arkansas. It was in Martha's. It was all. It was in a different part of the world, but. This was the first show that you had done a full run of that went on for a really long time. Not from you did the pilot that then you went 170 episodes on this one. Yeah, it was the first pilot I did that I think got on the air. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was see, three, three years into Cheers, the yeah. producers of Cheers left to go create Wings. Oh, and, okay. And yeah, and. Um, Brandon Tartikoff, who was, run, who was running NBC, said, you know, his, you know, parting words to us as we began were, good luck finding two funny guys in their mid-30s <laughs> to, to play the brothers. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out we found those guys fairly easily, Stephen Weber and Tim Daly. Yeah. And uh, the big problem, we couldn't find our leading lady for a long time. Helen Chapel. Isn't that a crazy last name? Yeah. Um, the role was originally named Helen Triancus, uh, and she had she was of Greek descent, fiery, and we couldn't find her, and we were ready to go. The whole show was cast, the sets were built, everyone was hired, and we couldn't find the woman, and we had to delay production several months while we kept looking. Huh. So it was ended up being a mid-season replacement for its first season. Oh, wow. And, uh, and we She's one of the... Uh, Crystal, really, Crystal Bernard is incredible. Crystal Bernard. Yeah. She's incredible, but they they had to let go of the Helen Trianca's character. Yeah. And we just brought in other actresses that could just do it their way. And in comes Krista with her Southern accent and all. And she, um, you know, instead of being from Greece, she was from, you know, Plano, Texas or something. Right, right, yeah. And, uh, and it worked. She was great on the show. Mm -hmm. And it was a really fun show to work on. It was a very, it was just funny. And I was yeah. very proud of that cast. And uh, it was, it definitely sort of started Thomas Hayden Church and Stephen Weber yeah. in the world of television. Tony Shalhoub. You know, Tim, Tony Shalhoub. I mean, so many people sort of got their start on there that are still doing great work. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you, you mentioned a bit to it, but you were still casting on Cheers while doing this show. How yeah. was it managing multiple productions kind of i mean this is still pretty early in your career in casting that's a that seems a, like a lot to juggle from the outside how was that for you 
it, it's really not, you know, in those years, those the years I was at Paramount and did those shows, you know, Cheers was on, I did it for seven years. And then after that, it slid right into Frasier for 11 years. Yeah. Wings straddled those two. The last four years of Cheers and the first four years of Frasier was mm-hmm. Wings. And I was doing three or four shows at a time. And it was just, we were just very organized. I had a, I had to expand my staff and I had my associate, Sheila Guthrie. She, you know, she did really stepped up and did a lot of great work, especially on wings. Mm -hmm. And we just made it happen. I sort of oversaw things and the way they were, they were all at Paramount. So I didn't have to travel. You know, I didn't have to go anywhere else to get in the car and go to other studios and see other producers. It was just all there. Mm -hmm. I would have, we often had our table readings on Thursday, I'm sorry, on Wednesday. And then we would shoot it the following Tuesday night, these multicam live before studio on eight shows. I would have table readings back to like four table readings back to back Wednesday morning. You know, one was from nine to nine 30, the next one, nine 30 to 10 and 10 to 10. Cause the same executives were going to all of them. Uh-huh. So we would just travel in a pack and go to all the table readings. What and a, it was fun. What it was a totally great fun. time. That sounds incredible. I was able, if, if I couldn't handle it, I wouldn't have taken it on, but you know, so I, anyway, it was it was fun to do it. And now I could do it so much better because I know how to cut to the chase so much better. Uh, because you just in time, you just learn how to do your job in a more concise way. Right. The things and, that you've got to deal with when it yeah, comes to yeah. executives. Or, yeah, because yeah. I was still figuring it out, you know, on the cheers years. Right. Just doing all that. But somehow I did. I mean, it's it's an incredible scent that you've had <laughs> over all of these years. I mean, you've you've worked on so many long running shows, um, and and while simultaneously casting a bunch of TV movies and short films, and even a little bit of producing, I saw in there. Uh, what is it that catches your attention of a project to work on? If they call me and ask me to do it, <laughs> catches my attention. Yeah. <laughs> See, you seriously, yeah. I mean, you know, I. I'm, I, I do say no to some things, but if something's pretty good, I'm like, thrilled to do it. Yeah. You know, and if someone isn't excited to work with me and, and I know them or meet them and think it would be fun, you don't know till you're in it if it's going to work or not. You mm-hmm. just don't. You, you can like it on the page. And then in the midst of it all, you, in, I, I don't say it out loud, but I'll just go, this is not working. This is not going to work. And I sometimes just know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but sometimes I do know, I go, this is great. It's going to, and then maybe, and that doesn't final work until you see the final project put together where it's really edited together. Yeah. You just don't know. You just don't know if it came together and you know, that in that final mix where all the elements are there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, when I saw the pilot of Modern Family uh, before, yeah. before the show had even been picked up, mm-hmm. I had the same experience as when I first read the script. I couldn't believe my eyes. I, it was the best thing I had ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. It just hit the ground running when it was first shown and first revealed and it became an enormous hit and immediately. And Continued for 11 years. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty it's, good. <laughs> it's it's a pretty good run. I have many more questions for you, but we've reached our hour. I, like I said at the beginning of this, um, I, I spoke with Chris Alexander, who is the EVP of Corporate Communications and Publicity at Disney Television Studios and Walt Disney Television. He helped set all this up, so thank you, Chris. And I, I will want to end and ask if there are any might have been stories because he says you have some pretty incredible Hmm. such and such could have been this role or could have been that role are there any of those stories that stand out to you well not quite that but i remember things that happened like this i remember when we were casting my so-called life Hmm. and carrie russell came in for the role of model number one (laughs) i mean it was a few lines and i my notes say a star and she, it was so apparent that she was just, she had it, you know, and I, we, she didn't even get that job, yeah. but I, you know, sometimes you just see it and you sort of track people's careers 
you know, and I just always remember the impact she made on me for a role that had no name. Just an under five, yeah. nothing role, but you wrote a story. Exactly. So, you know, um, once again, not a could have been because she got pretty big. Yeah. Um, well, this is this is sort of a humble brag story. When I won the Emmy for Modern Family, which was one of the thrills of my life, mm -hmm. um, at the governor's ball after, someone taps me on the shoulder. And I turn around and it's Kristen Wiig. And she says, Jeff, I don't know if you remember me. And she was huge already. but She was on SNL and yeah. she was majorly, her genius was recognized. Mm -hmm. And she said, I don't know if you remember me, but you gave me my first job and you really got me going. You know, it was a shopper number one on an episode of a sitcom I did called I'm With Her. Mm -hmm. And she said, I'll, I'll, I'm so thrilled I was here tonight to see that. Oh. And congratulations. And it made me feel so good. And I, then she went away. And 30 seconds later, I swear, someone else tapped me on the shoulder. It's John Hamm. And it was pretty much the same thing. <laughs> he said, Jeff. You always brought me in for cheers. I never booked it, but you brought me in so many times. You believed in me, and I've never forgotten that. Uh. And so people like that sort of zigzag in and out. When you've been doing it as long as I have, some people, even if you didn't hire them, you knew them when, mm -hmm. or you, you, know, you gave them a shot. And a lot of those people pop up in my life that I remember, I just remember when. Kaylee Kuoko mm -hmm. played Claire Danes as a as a little girl on my so-called life. <laughs> and years later at the SAG Awards, I finally met her again when she was there for Big Bang Theory. And I got to tell her that it was so great. But you know, not that I didn't make her career. She was doing she's done fine and that one little part didn't probably matter. But you just the six degrees of Yeah of my version of Kevin Bacon is, is so much fun. Yeah. And so a lot of that happens where you just have a history with people, even though it's slight or I'll be watching TV and I go, Oh yeah, I gave that guy a job when he was a kid or I, Oh, I always bring in that person or whoever mm -hmm. that happens. It's fun. I yeah. love it. <laughs> I, I truly love your passion for this. Um, it's, it's so Thank great you. to talk to, to, all of you casting directors who really do it's it's a care and a, a pleasure that you get uh that i really love delving into can people follow you online or is there a way to check out you said you do uh, uh lectures on casting how do people <laughs> find out about that sort of thing because because a well, big part of our audience is casting directors as well or future casting right. directors well they i'm i'm on twitter okay um and I, my lectures, ironically, I don't know how many more I'm going to be doing because I lecture on cruise ships. Oh. <laughs> and I, I don't think that's going to be the go-to place to Probably do not. them. I've been doing them for years. I've done like 14, 15 Lecturing... cruises over the years. Which huh. all, I've gone all over the world, and I, I just talk about my shows. It's the greatest gig ever. What a cool gig. <laughs> it's so fun. And, uh, but I don't do them sort of anywhere okay. Okay. more formally than that. Okay. Uh, this has been really delightful, Jeff. I I really appreciate you taking the time, sir. I've loved it, Charlie. I can't wait for part two. Absolutely. Seriously. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. There's a lot more of yours that I want to watch. There is. Yeah. There is. There I, I, I look forward to that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. And uh, I hope that you and yours stay safe during all of this craziness with COVID. And, uh, Same to you, Charlie. And look forward to everybody getting back to work. We hope that you have enjoyed this episode of Placing Faces. Do not forget to like, comment, subscribe, love heart, thumbs up, and share this episode. Do you like us? We'd like you to love us. Maria Perry, such a badass. Thank you so much for your help and guidance and extraordinary producing throughout this entire project, amongst many, many others. Now a quick word from Miss Perry. Hi, I'm Maria Perry, the producer of Placing Faces, and I'm just popping in to let you know that you can now find and support Placing Faces on Patreon. This podcast is a labor of love, and that means our production cycles are slower than we'd like when our day jobs get in the way. We're hoping to be able to get one more person involved and make the editing process a little quicker. And when you support us, you can join the community that we're building. Find out who we'll be talking to next, submit questions, and vote in polls about upcoming episodes. So find us on Patreon or check our website for a link at placingfaces.com.
Placing Faces is powered by Collaborator.com, a media production service connecting media professionals to companies, brands, and agencies, allowing you to scale your production based on your needs, connecting companies and creatives seamlessly. We would also like to thank our partners at the Casting Society of America. The CSA is a hub of information about this branch of the film industry. To learn more about the society and what it takes to get into casting, you can visit castingsociety.com. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, be well.